be in the community and to be effective in the community and to, to help us to spread your word. Father, we just ask you to be with each one that's here today. Father, we ask you to continue to, to watch over us and continue to bless each one. Oh, and the prince for me, I
that this is the word of God, and this is God's expectations for the church here at Corinth. He says here, And I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual people, but to as carnal, as to babes in Christ. I fed you with milk and not with solid food. For until now you were not able to receive it, and even now you are still not able. For you are still carnal, yet where there are strife and envy and divisions among you, are you not carnal, behaving like mere men? Now again, as we think about this, I want us to understand one point. We can read about the establishment of the Church of Christ there in Corinth in Acts chapter 18. Between the establishment of the church and when 1 Corinthians was written, it's between 6 to 10 years. So this is a good measuring stick for a new Christian. Paul, but again, remember, this was inspired by the Holy Spirit. God expected these Christians to be mature within at least 10 year period. So if we are past that in our spiritual walk, if we are past 6 to 10 years, and, I, and I said, I'll give you the benefit of that, we'll say 10 years. If we're past the 10 year period and we still don't feel like we can handle the meat of the word, then we've got a problem. We've got an issue we need to deal with. It's not a, something that will, uh, you know, it, it's a game breaker or anything, other than, other than the fact that you do not change it and you do not begin to grow. You have right now an opportunity today. If you feel like you are not where you need to be in your spiritual growth, you have an opportunity to change today. And God will accept that. If we continue to stumble along and still continue to seek for the milk of the word and not the meat of the word, and we ignore the process of growth, especially if you are over that 10-year limit, then you need to reevaluate your walk with God. But I want us to think about a few things here. In these words, again, Paul, God, if we will interject that, expected Corinth to be a mature congregation. Now, that doesn't mean that every person in this group was going to be mature, because some of them may not have joined right away. They may not have been baptized right away. There may have been a, a time gap there. But he meant as a whole, the congregation should have been an established, mature group of Christians, one that he could write to and explain to them the meat of the word. Here, Again, when you look at the book of 1 Corinthians, he is trying to deal with 21 different issues that this congregation has that they should not have as Christians. So this is why he says this. I cannot talk to you like mature Christians because you've got so many issues going on here. That you need to focus yourself on God's Word and begin to grow. You cannot grow unless you feed the Spirit. Just like a human being will not grow if they are not fed physical food. A child will remain to be a small infant child of physical stature, even though they, their mind began to, uh, uh, to grow and, and to, to mature. They will stay in a small stature if they're not fed properly. And we have to understand the same thing. If we are not fed properly, we will continue to stay in a small, babe-like stature as Christians. So we have to understand, God expects us within this six to ten year period to really reach the point where we can handle the need of the word. You know, when we have Christians that may have been Christians for 20, 25, 30 years that still are unsure about fundamental teachings, then we need to back up and start really focusing on these things because we have a job to do. Christianity is not an all-time vacation. It is work. God has put us in a place here in Arkadelphia where we are to work. And that's what, that's what really what Paul is trying to say here that said they are spending so much time in Corinth dealing with the issues that they have that they can't get out and really do the work that they need to do. So I can't really give you the assignments. I can't really expect you to go out and, and talk to other Christians because you yourself have so many issues. <laughs> So this is a good divine standard to think about. If you're at that 10-year apex, I, I, would, I would encourage you to really do an evaluation on yourself. That doesn't mean that I think a bunch of you are, are, are weak. I'm just saying I think it's a good thing to do. 
I do it myself periodically. I think about where am I in my study? Where am I in my growth? Am I growing the way I should? You know, again, and we know with small infants, when you have a child, they go on for three month checkups, six months checkups, yearly checkups. And there are things that have to be monitored, they have to be weighed, they have to be measured to see that everything is going properly. There's nothing wrong with doing checkups on yourself spiritually to see where you're at and to see if you really have grown from last year to this year. But well, I want us to think about this, and this is not, understand now, this is not going to be a down sermon, okay? I'm not jumping on anybody because Barbara and I have, have been talking as we've been here for about 16 months, and we have seen so much good coming out of this congregation. We have seen such a, we, we come here, we saw there was growth already in so many people, but we have seen so much more growth that, since we have been here. This is, this is a congregation that is working. This is a congregation that is striving, and that is wonderful. When we think about this, we understand, I understand even more, and if you would flip over to Matthew chapter 25 with me, we understand the, the verses here that, that Jesus stated, that Matthew wrote down here. Jesus was given an insight into what was going to happen at the second coming here. And he relates to them as sheep and goats, and he begins to talk about himself as being the king here that was going to look down. In verse 34 of Matthew 25, look at what he says here. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry, and feed you, or thirsty, and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in, or, or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these my brethren, you did it to me. That section of scripture is personified here at Pine Street. There is work being done here, and I, I would hazard to guess that many of you here may not even know all the work that's being done. I, Barbara and I are in a unique position, being minister of ministry. Why? We get to see all angles and everything. We're kind of on the outside looking around on all the, all the different angles, and we know what's going on. We see what's happening. We see the work that's being done here, and you may not realize it. What really made me think about this lesson this morning was the wonderful report we had Sunday night on the mission work in Honduras. You know, and, and, and that's not taking nothing away from them. They're doing a wonderful job, and that was a beautiful report. But I thought, you know, we need to do that for the congregation. You guys need to know what's happening in this congregation. You need to know that you are working, that things are getting done here. Barbara and I have noticed the differences within the community. When we first came here, and I, I've told you this before, there's no secret. When we first came here, we would talk about, well, We'd introduce ourselves and they say, well, where do you preach at? Oh, I preach at the Church of Christ on Punisher. Where's that at? You know, they, they didn't even know where the building was. But now, when we talk about being at Pine Street, oh yeah, I know exactly what that is. Those are the people who go out and they help people. They rake widows' yards and, and, they, and they are involved in the school program of feeding children on the weekends. When they go home, they don't have food. They, they pack those, they, they just enumerate all these things. They have a college group that comes from Henderson and from Washington, and they come together and they have a meal and they support. There's so much going on here. I, we're seeing it happen. We're seeing the community come alive with what's going on here. We're seeing the verses in Matthew chapter 25 where Jesus says, When I was hungry, you fed me, and when I was thirsty, you gave me drink. We're seeing these come alive. They're being personified here. There is much being done in Arkadelphia area, and that includes Bismarck and Gurdon and, and Cattle Valley and all the different areas that are included here in this congregation. Things are getting done. There is teaching going on here. We have more and more pupils in our classes on Sunday morning and Wednesday night, and there are people who are teaching these classes. They are spending time 
teaching and studying and preparing themselves. They don't just walk in and say, okay, well, this is our, this is our class. Let's go forward. There are people, I don't mean to embarrass anybody, and, and I, I may call out a few people, and that's, I'm not just singling people out. I'm just, I, I want to, I want to, I want you guys to understand what's, what's happening. I was sitting in my office. I always come in early, about 8.30 Sunday morning beforehand, and wasn't short, shortly after that, I hear the door open up, and here comes James in, to get ready for his class. And I'm thinking, wow. He's taking it seriously. But it's not the first time he's done that. He's done it every time. He prepares. And Morgan came in and she was getting prepared for her class. We, I see teachers coming in now ahead of time and they're, they have their material and they have their stuff that they're going to teach with and there's excitement in them. They're not just going through the motions. There are people that are excited about being in class to teach these young minds. And it's wonderful. There are people encouraging one another. We're hearing about people getting cards in the mail. And, and we see the, the effects here in our congregation. Before services start, there are people up and they're visiting and they're talking to people. And, and it's not just right in their old area, but they're getting up and they're coming to this side. And this side's coming over here and people are getting around. This is, we're, we're drawn together as a family and that's the way it's supposed to be. <laughs> That's the way God extended, uh, intended the church to be. That it would be a family. That we would all work together. And we're, we're seeing that happen. There are so much that is going on here. There are service things going on for members. It doesn't take very long if you tell some of the men here, hey, so-and-so needs some wood, wood cut in their yard or something done in their house. And there's people there and they're doing it. They make arrangements and they give up Saturdays. And they give up week, uh, day evenings to... To help each other, help people move to new houses or whatever it is, people are, are willing to roll their sleeves up and to get involved. There is service to this community. People are going out and they're helping, like in uh, the college group, and, and not just the college group, but some of us older people too, like me, uh, that have helped pack the bags for the weekend uh, meals for the kids at school that don't have proper meals on the weekends. They eat at school and that's maybe the only good meal they get all day long. But they're, we're packing bags to send to these schools so they can eat. And people are getting excited about it. People are wanting to know about it. Other members want to know how can they help to get this done. There is things happening here. And we need to be happy about it. We need to, we need to rejoice that the fact that we are a working congregation in an era and I know I have talked about it from the pulpit. I've talked about it. Bible study that we see so many different things happening within the church as a whole throughout the world. And, and many of these things are not positive. But we are on a positive run here in Arkansas. We are growing. And I don't mean by numbers. Just by numbers. We are growing by numbers. But I'm not just talking about numbers. When I say we are growing. And when I talk about growth. I'm talking about spiritual growth within the person. That's the most important thing to me and to Barbara is that we see spiritual growth within each person. Because the numbers will take care of themselves. If the world sees us representing Jesus Christ in truth and in purity, like the Bible says, the numbers will happen. But we are on a, we are on a, uh, we are involved in a working congregation here. Things are happening and we are making our influence felt within this community. Now we see all this and, and we, can, we can rejoice at what's happening, but one thing we can't do is stop. The next point is now what are we going to do for the future? We can't just say, well, you know, we've done all this last year and we're doing all this this early this year and, and now we just need to rest. No, no. There's a time for rest, but it's not now. We need to focus on the future. If you would turn with me to John chapter 9. In John chapter 9. We're going to start reading at verse 1 and read down to, to verse 5. Jesus makes one very important point in these five verses that I want us to dwell on right now. He says, now as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth, and his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned, but 
that the works of God should be revealed in him. I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when I can no more work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. The point we need to pull away from this is that we cannot stop working the works of him who sent us. Who did send us? Jesus Christ. In the Great Commission, he says, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them everything I have told you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Christ has sent us, just like as the Father sent Jesus Christ to this earth to serve this earth for 33 and a half years and die on the cross, He has sent us now to proclaim the gospel of Christ. And in that goes with everything the New Testament has in it. And in that is being benevolent to others, encouraging the congregations that are around us and the, and the members that are here, and proclaiming the Word of God to the lost. Those three points. That's the mission of the church in a nutshell. But there's a lot more about it than just reciting those three things. We have to roll our sleeves up and we have to get to work. We have proven here at Arkadelby that we do that. But now what we have to do is continue to that. We can't give up. We can't rest on our laurels. We have to continue to go forward. We have to continue until the time when we truly can lay down and rest. We must work the works of Him who, who we belong to. We claim to belong to Christ. Every time we say, I am a Christian, you are saying, I belong to Jesus Christ. And if we belong to Christ, we must do the work that He has laid out for us to do. We must continue to do that. The time is coming when we will lay down our swords. And again, I don't want this to be a, a downer sermon now, okay? But, but I understand what I'm saying. The time is coming when, when we will rest from our labors. And that's when we cease to live on this earth any longer. But until that time, we are called upon as Christians to work, to labor. Like I said, we've proven we can do it here. And I have all confidence, Barbara has all confidence, that we will continue to do it here. We have seen the, the compassion that this congregation has for the lost. We have seen the love this congregation has for each other. We have seen how you guys can work together and come together and help each other. And I know, and Barbara knows, that it's going to continue. We can't just lay down and rest them. We have to continue to work. If you would, flip over to Revelation chapter 2. I'm going to share just a, a little bit that Jesus stated here to this, this church here in Smyrna. In Revelation chapter 2 and verses 8 through 11. And this will give you an opportunity to correct something I had said once before. I have made the comment once before that there was only one church of the seven churches of Asia that did not have any condemnation. And, and Doyle pointed out to me that there were two of them. And he's right, there are two of them. Smyrna is one of them and Philadelphia is one of them. But we're going to look at one right now. And it says here, to the angel of the church in Smyrna, write, these things says the first and the last who was dead and came to life. It says, I know your works, your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich. And I know the blasphemy that of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. It says, do not fear any of those who, those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested and you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. What he's saying here is to this congregation, he says, you know what? You might be small in number. You may not have a lot of resources, but you are rich, spiritually rich. When we came to this congregation, again, it's no big secret. You guys were on a downslide as far as members were going. You might have thought of yourself as being poor and poverty-stricken in that sense, but you weren't. You had a great spirit. You are rich, spiritually speaking. And that, that spiritual nature there has been lit on fire now and it is growing and it is expanding. 
You are like this church at Smyrna. You may think that we don't have a lot to offer, but we have everything to offer. We have Jesus Christ to offer. We have the truth of the gospel of Christ to give to anyone who will listen. We have everything that we need to offer. We don't need to offer anything more. Because it is Jesus Christ which saves. It is not anyone else or anything else. But it is Jesus Christ. And he said there in verse 7, Do not fear any of those things which might happen to you when you go through the suffering. And, and we might have to go through suffering here in this congregation. We may go through persecution. In fact, the gospel tells us that if you are a Christian, if you are faithful to God, you will endure persecution. There's no doubt about it. So when we do it, go through persecution and we do have to suffer, the Scripture says, do not be afraid. We looked at it this morning in, in 1 Peter chapter 3. Peter quoted out of Isaiah chapter 8, says, do not be afraid of what those people can do to you. Because nobody can take away your salvation. There's not a single person in this world that can ever take away your salvation. You can give it up and you can walk away and nobody can take it from them. Doesn't matter what they do. We can be brave and we can be courageous, just like they were in the first century when this letter of Revelation was written to the churches. And we need to be. And I believe we're going to be here at Arkadelphia. We are going to be that group of people that will continue to go on until the time when we do lay down our swords and rest. You know, it, it's a sad thing when we see our friends and our family loved ones pass on. And, yeah, but it's only sad for us. It's not sad for them. If they're faithful children of God. There's nothing sad about it. They're going to a place where there is no pain and suffering, where they will be preparing themselves for a life, or an eternity in heaven, a spiritual life in heaven. Hebrews chapter 4 tells us here, when we talk about the rest, so that our rest is not to be done on this earth, but our rest is to be done in the hereafter. And he says, For if Joshua had given them, speaking about the people of Israel, rest, then he would not have spoken of another rest. There remains therefore a rest for the people of God. For he who has entered his rest has himself also ceased from his works as God did from his. Let us therefore be diligent to enter into that rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disbelief. We have to continue to, to fight the good fight of faith. We have to continue to work and never give up the struggle. We have to continue to raise our swords high and never let anyone take it from us. Because someday, as I said, when that rest comes, we can lay it down with confidence that we have fought the good fight, we have kept the faith, and we have finished the course, as Paul said in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 7. And we will be able to say, the Lord has a crown of righteousness waiting for me when I enter heaven that one great day. I want to, I'm going to lay that all aside now and I'm just going to talk to you just for just a couple moments. Barbara and I have always, whenever, and we've been in ministry for 21 years, 21 plus years now, and we have always looked at the people in the congregation as almost as our children. That may seem a little odd because most of the people in our congregation are always older than us. But when we think about it, we still are very parental when it comes to the congregations where we work at. It's because we care about every person that's here, including the visitors, even though you may not be a part of the congregation. While you're here, you're part of our family. And we care about you. And we want to hold you up. We want to encourage you. That's why we try to support everything that happens around here so, so everyone knows that, that we'll be there for them. But we do have great confidence in this congregation, this group of people, to continue to live the life that needs to be lived here in Arkadelphia, in Gurdon, and Bismarck, and Caddo Valley, and wherever else if I may be missing a place. But you can continue to live the life not just as you meet here in this building, but as you're out in this world and you're living the way God wants you to live, you will influence so many people. 
And who knows? We may never know the influence that we have and how many people we bring to Christ. Because we may never see them ever again. But just a simple word and a simple encouragement sometimes is all someone needs. But we have every confidence that that's going to continue here. We're happy to be here as a part of this congregation. And we do want you to know that we pray for each of you every day. That we continue to fight the good fight of faith. The lesson is yours this morning. If you need the prayers of this congregation, we'll be happy to pray with you. If you're here this morning, you're not a Christian. If you want to be a part of God's family, want to be a part of this family here in Arkadelphia, we'd be happy to assist you in putting on Christ through baptism. What do we do for you? You come now as we stand and sign this song and take your prayer. While we pray and while we believe, while we believe,